All right, uh, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your faithfulness, for your richness and your riches of your love, Jesus, your faithfulness, uh, your kindness towards us. Lord, everything. Lord, I pray that uh, every day that there will be a revelation of who you are in our lives, Lord. I pray that we will never lose the wonder of who you are, God. I, and even as we uh, go about learning today from your word, uh, Holy Spirit, you speak to us through your word. You teach us. You are our teacher. Uh, we open up our hearts. We open up our minds, Lord, to receive from you. Uh, I submit and surrender my voice, uh, my my tongue. Holy Spirit, you speak to me. You speak through me. I submit and surrender, Lord. I, I thank you for what you're about to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, well, thanks again for uh, joining in. Uh, we've been going through the theology of worship or how worship was organized in the Old Testament. Uh, and we've started from the looking from the life of Abraham. Uh, come, we've learned how that he was a man of altars. Uh, in many cases that he was a man of worship. He would constantly remind himself of who God is. And every time he would come uh, encounter or was reminded of something uh, of how good God is, that he would build an altar, he would submit and surrender and worship. And then we, and from then on, we've looked at various aspects of how worship was organized in the Old Testament from the temple that Solomon built. Uh, you know, it was a time of celebration, it was a time of a jubilee, uh, and where the whole community, the society, uh, the cities and towns, people full of from different towns and villages would come to the temple to honor, to worship, to celebrate the faithfulness of God. Uh, it was not just, I'm sure it was not just a one hour or a two hour event on a Sunday morning, uh, but it, it, it must have been an extravagant time of worship, uh, like, you know, extravagant, ex and lavish. Uh, God with praise and worship. Uh, so we saw that in the Temple of Solomon, and then we looked at briefly what uh, the Psalms had to teach us about worship, when, how, where, why, what. We looked at all those philosophical questions or journalistic uh, questions, the kind of questions all the journalists ask, and we see what the Psalms had to teach us. We went through that briefly, uh, and uh, and we concluded with going through the tabernacle of Moses, uh, right, in the last session. And so I hope so far that, uh, you know, there was something that you could learn, uh, you could take away, of, you know, for your personal spiritual growth and also understanding this, uh, just this topic of worship just a little bit more deeper. Okay, um, so we'll again just do another quick recap of the Tabernacle of Moses, uh, what we covered in the last class, and we'll continue into the Tabernacle of David in this session. Okay, uh, so very quickly about the Tabernacle of Moses, we really have to start the Tabernacle of Moses in Genesis chapter three, uh, because until the until the fall happened, the the spirit of God and the spirit of man was united, right? They dwelt to. Uh, they dwelt in the presence of God uh, as one. Uh, as soon as the, they sinned, they were separated from his presence. That that you know, That is the basic definition of sin, is that separation from the presence of God, from the spirit of God. Uh, we've become alienated, so to say, right? Or we've become something that uh, you know, we are not familiar with because we are separated from God. We, our identity, our everything, the meaning, the purpose uh, of life and everything about us is found in Him because we are made in His image. Because of sin, uh, we were separated and we were no longer in His presence. Uh, and from there on, from Genesis chapter 3 all the way to Exodus chapter 25, uh, you can think about all the wonderful, great stories that's happened uh, in between those chapters. Uh, but, you know, you read about, uh, you know, God's visitations that would happen time and time again. Right. He visited, he visited Abraham. He visited Jacob. He visited uh, uh, Joshua. Uh, and, you know, time and time again, there are multiple visitations of God that happens from Genesis 3 to Exodus 25. Right, his hand was on him. The spirit of the Lord was on him. But 
there was never a dwelling place for all these years. So the gap between Genesis 3 and Exodus 25 is 2,500 years, all right? I'm just recapping everything so that, you know, we're just refreshing our memories. Uh, so for 2,500 years, there was no dwelling place, a resting place for God. And hence, God, God tells Moses, make them build me a sanctuary and, and there I will meet with you. And so finally, the tabernacle of Moses was the meeting place that uh, what was in the Garden of Eden, which was lost in the Garden of Eden. So it was a bridge, uh, a bridge that was building a gap, fixing the gap between heaven and earth, where so divinity could meet with humanity, right? Uh, humanity w w uh, was... God was too holy uh, to come and meet with us without a meeting place, and man was too sinful to meet with God. And so there had to be a common ground that need, that had to be established, and hence the tabernacle of Moses, right? And in the tabernacle of Moses, we, we started it off not just from the outer courts, but from the gate. Uh, and where we, how we encounter Jesus uh, in all his four offices at the gate, right? So the gate is the place of introduction. Uh, and then we come into the outer court. We look at the brazen altar, which is a place of reconciliation. It, uh, the altar, right? It's a place of sacrifice, symbolizing the cross, where you surrender your will, your mind. Everything all about you is surrendered there. Uh, and that initiates, uh, you know, that is where the process of reconciliation is begun. And then the bronze laver or the brazen laver is the place of sanctification, right? Uh, so salvation may be a one-time thing where you give your life to God, but the sanctification is a process, right? We do not attain salvation with our works. So, so to speak, so we don't, uh, washing of the hands symbolize or represented works. But salvation is a free gift given to us. We only have to choose it, right? And so we don't attain salvation with works, you know, or righteousness with, okay, we climb 1,000 steps, we attain salvation. We, uh, you know, we go without eating for 100 days, we attain salvation. No, we don't attain salvation with works. But, you know, we attain salvation with the grace of God that he has offered to us. However, we continue to walk in the process of sanctification because we walk in this walk of life. Right? We walk this walk of faith. We run this race, right? And so that symbolizes faith. So we can't. We need to be sanctified, uh, you know, on a regular basis. And the Word of God does it. And uh, you know, as we mentioned, that the brazen labor on the inside of it was made with the mirrors that was used by the women, uh, right? So, and the Word of God says in James chapter one, it's the Word of God is a mirror, right? You don't look at yourself in the mirror and go back the same way. You do something. There has to be a change. And so uh, that sanctification uh, is, uh, what is what we call it as the change uh, that it brings. And then inside uh, the inner court, you see the table of showbread, which is a place of satisfaction. The golden lampstand, it's a place of illumination and revelation. And then there's a golden altar of incense, which uh, represents a, uh, a place of intercession, right? Uh, and then finally, we are in the Holy of Holies. Here, there is only one piece of furniture. Uh, there is no artificial light. There is the glory of God that's lighting up the room. Um, there, you don't do anything. You just be still and behold the glory and the beauty and the wonder of who God is. Okay, and that is in the Holy of Holies. Um, and so that's like a brief recap of the Tabernacle of Moses. Uh, I hope you all are still alive and all is well. Okay, and we slowly, we will uh, transition into learning a little bit about the Tabernacle of David. Okay, so um, in the book of Exodus, uh, you read a lot about Exodus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, you know, they've had the temple, uh, the tabernacle of God, the Ark of the Covenant, and whatnot. And slowly, you move into the book of Joshua, right? And again, in the book of Joshua, you see when they were crossing the river Jordan, they again take the Ark of the Covenant, carry the Ark of the Covenant with them. And as soon as their feet touches the river, the waters, and the waters part, right? It's not just the Red Sea that parted, if you... Okay. <laughs> the Jordan, River Jordan also parted. So the Ark of the Covenant uh, was still a huge deal in the book of Joshua. Okay, uh, now you may, you, you don't read a lot about the tabernacle in itself. You begin to wonder, okay, the Ark of the Covenant is there, but what about the tabernacle? Because it doesn't talk a lot. 
in the book of Joshua. And then you come to the book of Judges. It seems a lot has happened. The Israelites have taken over the land of Canaan. Uh, they haven't chased away every people, uh, you know, the tribe of Canaan that uh, God tells them to chase away. They compromise. They they let some of their enemy live in their land, um, who come back to persecute them later on. So we go through the book of Joshua. You don't read much about the tabernacle. You hardly. And then you come to the book of Judges. It's it's almost like that essence of worship that was established that God gave Moses is not even heard. And so you read about it in one verse in book of Judges, in Judges chapter 2, verse 10. Let me see if I can find it. Judges chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, it's one of uh, the uh, very sad uh, verses in the book, uh, in the Bible. Judges chapter 2 verse 10, it says, And all that generation, that is the previous, the elderly generation, were gathered to their fathers. It simply means that they passed away. right? And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. So who did not know the Lord, that means who did not know his ways, who did not, who were not grateful. That means they did not know that he parted the sea. They did not know that he provided manna from heaven, a quail from heaven, the, bit, turning the bitter waters into sweet waters from the rock. They did not know any of this. They did not know that there was a tabernacle. They did not know that God led them out of Egypt with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They did not know. And so we slowly see the tabernacle of Moses being diminished and God's ways not being followed. And you read through the book of Judges, they've gone back to worship in the form or the practice of altars. So you wonder, where, where is the tabernacle? Where's the ark? There's no news about it. They go back to building altars and worship. Some of them are false altars. That is false. Uh, and you read about the, you know, even the father of Gideon, which is, you know, the book of Judges is famous for. Um, the father of Gideon had built an altar for the Canaan, Canaanite god Baal. Right? And so there was false worship that was introduced later in this full, and you read about it in the book of Judges. Uh, they started to worship the god of the Canaanites which they were specifically and very clearly told by God not to com uh, compromise to their ways. But that's exactly what they do. Okay? Um, and so you wonder what's happening. And then much later, you get to know, in, in when you come to the book of First Samuel, Ruth is there. The book of Ruth is just there as a bridge. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a nice book. But, you know, but it's... It's just there to just deviate for some time from what's happening. And then we get back, uh, you know, in the book of 1 Samuel. Now, again, in the, first, in the book of 1 Samuel, you don't uh, read about the tabernacle itself. But what, you, what we do find out is that the Ark of the Covenant was kept in a place called Shiloh. Okay, that's all we find out. That's all we know about it. That the Ark of the Covenant was kept in a place called Shiloh. All right. Okay. So, uh, this what we are trying to establish here is a background for, to the tabernacle of David. All right. Um, so, um, let's go to Samuel chapter four. We go to First Samuel chapter four. Just do a quick pause here, and just want to check: is everybody uh, following? Are you all with me? All right, great. Um, so we're going to read uh, the chapter. Uh, First Samuel chapter four, and we might read a lot. Um, so I hope that's okay. Okay, keep your Bibles open. Uh, 
uh, this is I feel is a very uh, important chapter um, okay so and the word of and the word of Samuel came to all Israel I'm reading from verse 1 now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines they encamped at Ebenezer and the Philistines encamped at Aphek the Philistines drew up in line against Israel and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh. That means, you know, he said that you learned that Ark of the Covenant was in the place called Shiloh. That it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. Okay, stop. So what's happening here is that they are being, Israelites are being attacked by the Philistines. The battle uh, opens up and Israel go into battle and 4,000 men die and uh, it's a huge defeat, a huge loss. Now, if you read First Samuel, um, you know, chapter 1, 2, 3, uh, you know, there's the introduction of the characters. Right? There's an the introduction of Samuel's mother in chapter one, Hannah. Uh, how she prays for Samuel, and she God uh, God gives her Samuel, and then she read she dedicates Samuel to the Lord in the temple. Uh, and then we we are introduced to the high priest at that time, who was Eli, and talks about how Eli was older in age. He was huge. Basically, he was very fat and he was old and he was blind he couldn't see very well he couldn't move a lot and he had two sons Hophni and Phinehas uh, they were very sin uh, sinful sons uh, they were they are they were they are from the tribe of Levites they are supposed to be priests but instead of being holy and set apart and doing the duties of the Lord in the temple they did uh, you know, uh, they committed sin in the eyes of the Lord, it says, right? They would sleep with women who would come to the temple. They did all kinds of sexual immorality. So they had no relationship with this God of Israel. No relationship. That is just a brief context to chapter 4. So, you know, there's this uh, character called Eli, Samuel. Eli had two sons, Ophni and Phinehas. They were very sinful. And then we are in verse four. They go uh, chapter four. Uh, you know they go into battle. They lose, uh, and they say, "Okay, let us bring back the ark of the covenant, so we will, you know, we will win win over our enemies." Verse four from chapter four. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the ark of the covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. <laughs> And the two sons of uh, Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into camp, all Israel gave mighty shout so that the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, What does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the Ark of the Covenant had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, A God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with the very sort of plague in the wilderness. It's funny that the Philistines know about this God of Israel, and they hardly know about it's such an such an irony <laughs> okay uh, verse 9 it says take courage and be uh, and be men O Philistines lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you be men and fight verse 10 okay so the Philistines fought and the Israel was defeated and they fled every man to his home they fled like cowards and there was a very great slaughter for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell wow it's quite a chapter so far isn't it so this Israel 
there's the battle against the Philistines. They lose the battle the first time. 4,000 men die. 4,000 men die. But they, th they go back to the history books and see, okay, hey, in the past, whenever the Ark of the Covenant will, went ahead, went before, God gave Israelites the victory. So let's follow that formula. Let's try that formula again. So what was happening is that they were trying to be religious without relationship. Right? They thought, okay, it's, it's a formula. If you do, if you do so, so, this, this, and this, we'll get it. Without the relationship, without intimacy with the Lord, if you fall, no formula is going to work. Right? It could be the formula that God himself has given to us, but without intimacy and relationship, he is not going to establish or accomplish anything. And Israel learned it a very hard way. 30,000 people died on that day. And verse 11, chapter 4, And the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas died. Right? Hophni and Phinehas died. So they are seeing this in addition to the 30,000 people who died. They are, the scripture is emphasizing on the two sons of Eli. It doesn't need to do that, but it, and every time it's doing that, you need to ask why. And most of the time, it's fall, it, it follows up. Why? Okay. Um, Sorry, guys. Apologies, I'm just going to put my phone. Back. Uh, let's look at um, verse 12. What we can do is, yeah, OK. Uh, we're just going to continue reading this chapter uh, just so we understand the depth of uh, what's happening, okay? So verse 12, a man of Benjamin uh, ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn with the dirt on his head. When he arrived, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried out. What did he say? That the Ark has been captured. Uh, you know, 30,000 men have died. And so the whole city cried out. When Eli heard the sound of the outcry, he said, what is this uproar? And then the man hurried and came and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old and his eyes were set so that he could not see. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. And he said, how did it go, my son? Verse 17, he brought the news, answered uh, and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. And there has been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And the ark of God has been captured. As soon as he mentioned the Ark of God, not even when he mentioned the sons, as soon as he mentioned the Ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died. For the man was old and heavy. He had judged Israel 40 years. Now his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant about to give birth. And when she heard that the news of the Ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed and gave birth for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, a woman attending her to her said, do not be afraid for you have borne a son. And she did not answer or pay attention. And she named the child Ichabod saying the glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God had been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. Verse 22, last verse. 
And she said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. It's a very, very sad day in Israel, in the history of Israel. It's one of the most tragic days ever. It's a very bad day. It wasn't enough that Israel lost the battle, but they lost in a very bad way. They lost 30,000 men. 30,000 men. Some towns or villages have 35,000 people as their population overall. 30,000 people had died. And when they heard that Eli dies, and the pregnant wife goes into labor and gives birth and names the son Ichabod. Ichabod simply means the glory has departed. The glory of God is the manifest presence of God. And so it's a, it's a symbol to say that, again, when, the, when we are out of the presence of God, when the presence of God leaves, there is death. Eli dies. When the presence of God leaves, we lose leadership. Eli was a leader. He was a judge who judged for 40 years, right? We lose headship. We lose leadership. Um, this chapter is packed. Okay? So we are in 1 Samuel chapter 4. So this is, again, it's like Genesis chapter 3, but in a, very, in a little bit of a small scale. The Ark of God has been captured by the Philistines. Uh, you can read chapter 5, chapter 6. It's, it's uh, very interesting. It's amazing. Uh, what they do, the Philistines do, is they take the Ark of the Covenant and keep it in their temple before their god called Dagon. And so what happens when they keep it before Dagon is the, you know, the next morning they come and see that the, the idol has fallen down before the Ark of the Covenant. And so they erect it again. And the next day it's fallen again, but it's not just fallen, it's fallen and it's broken its head. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, so all the Philistines are alarmed. They don't want to have the Ark of the Covenant with them. They send it away. Just do whatever you want to do with it. Uh, let's fast forward, shall we? Um, we are in First Samuel chapter 4. Let's go to Second Samuel chapter 6. First Samuel, from First Samuel chapter four to Second Samuel chapter six. So, um, from First Samuel chapter four uh, to between to Second Samuel chapter six the scholars again say that the timeline is approximately 70 odd years more or less 70 odd years and in that 70 years again a lot of things happen right uh, <clears throat> the ark has been captured it's not back in jerusalem it's not back in israel yet and you know saul becomes a very prominent prophet he anoints saul as king we learn that Saul reigned for 40 years as king. Um, and then David comes into power slowly. Um, you know, and there's a lot, of, lot happens until Saul comes into the power, uh, as, is anointed as king. And so for 70 odd years, nobody thought or felt like bringing the ark back and building a dwelling place for God again. until 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1, it says, David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel. How many? 30,000. So one of the first things he does after becoming king over Judah and Israel, the first thing he does is he decides to bring the Ark of the Covenant back. Now, David, again, must have gone to the book history books and found out, okay, on the day that the Ark of the Covenant was taken, 30,000 men had died. So I'm going to take the same number of men and I'm going to bring the Ark of the Covenant back, the presence of God back, right, to the place where it belongs. 
so 30,000 men and David arose and <clears throat> and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the Ark of the Covenant who is called by the name of the Lord of hosts who sits enthroned on the cherubim okay um, so this uh, is really the just the background um, for the tabernacle of David um, so the first thing what David does is he brings the Ark of the Covenant back. <clears throat> Saul was man of position, but David was the man after the presence. Right? For Saul, the position of the king was more important. Uh, you know, even after Saul had disobeyed God, uh, sinned against God, uh, Saul comes, uh, Sam, Samuel comes to confront uh, Saul, says, Samuel tells to Saul, you know, God has chosen someone else. He has rejected you as a king. This conversation is happening inside the tent. Saul's response to Samuel is, okay, but will you just walk out of the tent with me so that people will look and still believe that, you know, God is with me and I'm still the king? You see, for him, uh, the reputation of what people thought about Saul was more important. The position was more important to Saul. And for 70 odd years, no one, even the king of Israel at that time, Saul, didn't feel like or think about going and bringing the Ark of the Covenant back until David. And so, the worshipper, a true worshipper, we're talking about, uh, you know, worship ministry. Uh, a true worshipper will is always in the pursuit of God's presence. Uh, a thriving worship ministry of any church of or any ministry is a ministry or a team that is pursuing or going after the presence of God. If that is not the priority, if if pursuing the presence of God is not the priority of your worship team or your worship ministry, uh, it's not going to last long. Right? When the Ark of the Covenant was not there for 70 odd years and then go back from the book of Joshua and Judges, worship continued to happen. That is to say that you can continue to have church services. You can continue to play church without the presence of God. Right? We can continue to sing songs, do everything that we have to do, preach, and, and have a normal Sunday morning services without the presence of God. But what is the point? Right? What, what brings meaning to Anything we do for God is His presence, is our pursuit of Him, of who, who He is. Right? Uh, without that, we are just, um, you know, not doing anything. Uh, just like, you know, the scripture says we're like empty vessels making loud noise, like loud cymbals, gonging cymbals. Um, you know, you sing songs away from me. Um, that's how God would react to our worship. But and you read a lot about the Tabernacle of David, uh, you know, from chapter sixteen of First Chronicles, um, and you know, First Chronicles chapter sixteen, verse one to three, uh, we see that David erects the Tabernacle, uh, a Tabernacle for for the Ark of the Covenant. Um, now this is a very different Tabernacle from the Tabernacle of Moses. Uh, there is no outer courts, inner courts. Straight away, it's just the Holy of Holies. It's just the Ark of the Covenant around it. Uh, um, you, one might ask, how come, why, then why was there inner courts and outer courts in the Tabernacle of Moses and there was nothing here? Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful mystery, I would say, uh, and that only God can explain and teach us because the only thing I can ex say is David, although he was known as a worshiper, he was a warrior, he was a king, we don't talk a lot about David as a prophet, right? The prophetic on the David was, must have been, I mean, powerful, <laughs> right? We read about it in Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is all about the crucifixion. 
uh, and David writes that song. And uh, you can just only think about the prophetic. So David, although in the old covenant, lived as if he was in the new covenant. He understood that what matters to God is obedience. More than anything you can do, more than any uh, principle or method or whatnot, it is being obedient to him. That he, he learned that, right? And what is what is it in the new covenant is that the veil is torn. We can, Bible says, we can enter the throne, you know, the, the throne of grace. It just doesn't say enter the throne of grace. It says enter boldly. It talks about the attitude in the manner that you can enter the presence of God. And David learned that. Right? He learned that, okay, you know, he loves us. Although in the old covenant, he lived as if he was in the new covenant. That is why David is such a big deal in the context of worship, right? In the tabernacle that he built. And even though that there was no inner courts or outer courts and all the brazen altars and whatnot, there was still order. There was no, it, his presence was not, the presence of God was not taken for granted. David didn't say, like, oh yeah, I'm, you know, I've seen it, the new covenant, it's like this, you know, anybody can go in. There was no, uh, there was no irreverence in his attitude. Okay, and so uh, First Chronicles chapter sixteen, we see that from one to three, it says they so they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle that David erected for it. It doesn't say some men of Israel erected. It's a, I mean, if it's saying that David erected, that means he must have single-handedly taken the initiative and gone ahead and set it up. The king of Israel, Judah the king of the northern and the southern kingdom, he went and he made sure that he will erect the tabernacle, the king, the leader. And he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Then he distributed to everyone of Israel, both man and woman, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. There was celebration. There was generosity. There was royal generosity to everyone in Israel. And that is what the presence of God releases. It brings about royal generosity. It stirs your heart to give, right? And then it brings about order. The second point in your notes in page 23 talks about, um, again, order. David appointed, this is in First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 4. It says, he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord, to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the Lord. Now, uh, when we, let's quickly go back to, uh, you know, Second Samuel chapter six. So, um, Second Chronicles, uh, sorry, Second Samuel, chapter six. We see that David goes and brings the ark back, right? Uh, verse three, chapter six, verse three. It says that they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. Verse 6, verse 5, And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. Verse 6, And when they came to a threshing floor, Nakon, Uzzah, put out his hand to the ark of God to, and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was killed against uh, was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. Okay, so uh, again, what's happening here is that um, although David went back to the history books of Israel, that he learned that thirty thousand men were died, 
uh, what he did not remember is something that was written in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Okay, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 17 for a second. Where is that? Okay. So let's go. To, are you there? Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17. Okay. Um, let's read. Um, I'm going to read from verse 14. Okay. Um, just, I'm going to read a few scriptures, but I'm going to read from verse 14 just to give us the context. So this is again God talking. In Deuteronomy 17 14 it says when you come to the land of the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and then say I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose one from among your brothers you shall set as king over you you may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother okay this is in the book of Deuteronomy hundreds of years before the before you know first samuel where saul is anointed as king god is prophesying he's saying there will come a time that where you will ask for yourself a king like you will look at all the other nations and say all the other nations have king why don't we have a king you will reject me as your king but ask for yourself a king this is god prophesying okay and then god says sure you can have a king. Uh, I will choose that, uh, you know, that person for you. Verse 16 says, Only he must not require many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. Verse 17, And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book. Look at this. He shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life. And that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and the statutes and doing them. Verse, last verse, verse 20, it says, and, this heart, and his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children is Israel. So God's command for anyone who would become a king was to meditate on the word of the Lord was to know about the word of the Lord, was to know about the commandments of the word of the Lord. Now, David was passionate worshiper, absolute, and you know, hats off, right? Uh, he went back to the history books of Israel and learned that there was a great defeat, 30,000 men died, you know, and he would take 30,000 men to bring the Ark of, all of that, all, everything what he's done so far is commendable. But what he would have, must have forgotten to do is gone back to the law of the law, Lord and and read it and if he had read it he would have known that only the levites were supposed to carry the ark it was not meant to be carried on on the bullock cart the presence of god is is meant to be carried by us human beings we are to be the host of the presence of god and so what happens was died and david is upset and then he goes back to the book of the law and then he learned that Levites were are the ones assigned are supposed to be carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And then he learns from his mistake, uh, but that, that mistake was pretty costly, <laughs> uh, right? But nevertheless, that he would learn. So ag again, I wanted to share this thing as, uh, as again, a context of how they would, would have learned, right, from the scriptures. Okay, uh, are you all still with me? Great. Um, so what we'll do, we'll pause here, we'll take a break, and we'll resume in the next session. Okay? Thank you.